Hello everyone, Jay here from Jade Productions here for another review. Um, you know, I like to take my time when I do these reviews and have a bit of time with the codex, so of course this one's a few days late. I did plan on doing this, you know, earlier in the week, in fact on the weekend, but um, when I first got the book, but I took my time to pour over it a little bit more and um, also uh, see it in action a little bit. Now, the... <laughs> Number one thing I just want to address is that where before this codex was released, there were some rumors going about circulating from like a French gaming studio or something that this codex was disappointing and or weak. The following is my opinion on those rumors of having read this codex. <laughs> uh, uh, space clowns. Okay. So let's jump straight into here. So as per normal, I'm not really going to cover a lot of the units themselves. I'll just give a brief mention of them to them, what they do, you know. So you've got your troop master. You've got so there's a couple of things to do with this. If you're familiar with Harlequins, you all already already uh, know what the Harlequins do. Basically, they've all got a rule for rising crescendo, which means they can advance and charge in the same turn, and they can fall back and still shoot and charge in the same turn. Most of them have flip belts, in fact all the infantry have flip belts, so they essentially have fly, but not fly. And then the vast majority of the infantry have hollow suits, which give them a 4-up invul save, which is fantastic, because it's a 4-up save that you just can't get rid of, and the only way around is mortal wounds or a null zone. Um, or the death hex, I think the chaos one is called. Um, so, yeah, you've got those common elements to all of your, all of your, uh, guys in here, and that alone, combined with their ridiculous speed, makes Harlequins fantastic. My one regret is that these guys were removed, because these guys, for those of you who don't know, for those of you who are new players to Warhammer 40k, um, used to be inside of the Codex, um, Craft Worlds, which was formerly known as Craft World as Codex Eldar. Now, they were then removed and made into their own separate faction, and that was a waste of time, and then eventually they got rebooted with new models and units, and that was fantastic, because old Harlequin models were terrible. Now, I personally never got around to getting any of these, but I've got um, a friend who has these now, and yeah. Um, and I've gotten to see these in action, and holy shit, do they... These things are a blender. You either blend your enemy with this faction, or you, um, go up in confetti. And yet, funnily enough, this faction has higher resilience than both the Dark Elder and the Craft World Elder, mostly due to that, you know, involve saves across the board. And they even have access now in this codex to a lot of minus one, minus two mechanics, which makes, you know, combined with those invol saves, certainly can make you blush and think, wow, I'd really prefer to be fighting in a low to craft world right now. So your first unit and your first HQ in this codex is your troop master. Standard Harlequin sort of captain-y thing. He's got all those rules I mentioned. You can give him all the fancy tools and kit that your Harlequins can take. Harlequin blades, caresses, embraces, kisses, power swords, shuriken pistols, fusion pistols, neuro disruptors. Neuro disruptor... I think it's had a slight change, but I'm not sure on that one. Um, you're probably gonna take a shuriken pistol and a... uh, probably a uh, power sword, just to keep it simple. Um... Yeah, he can take all that kind of stuff. He's got the choreographer of war, which... If you're new to Harlequins and don't know what that does, uh, in the fight phase, you reroll failed to wound rolls for friendly mask units that are within six inches of him. So he's kind of like... He's kind of like a reverse Space Marine Chaplain. So, yeah, he's there. He's very cheap. You're probably going to end up taking a lot of him. Um, your second HQ choice that you've got available is still the Shadow Seer. Had a slight change to the uh, number of psychic powers it... Nose, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, Nose, Smite, and two Psychic Powers now. And I can attempt to cast two and attempt to deny one. Um, the Shadow Seer for is basically just going to be your primary guy. The Psychic Powers that the Harlequins have, especially now that they've been updated, are... They're 
two you they're such a great toolbox you're never not going to have at least two of these in your army if you're starting harlequins you're probably going to want two of these minimum maybe even three um it's got all that kind of thing and then it's got a really really annoying ability called shield from harm which is the only kind of the only mechanic like this that actually exists in anywhere in 40k that I've seen so far and uh, you subtract one from your opponent subtracts one from rune rolls for any attacks made against friendly mask infantry units that are within six inches of any models with this ability. That's fantastic. So, sure, your auras aren't the auras that um, other factions have, but it's still fantastic aura that you've got there. Um, again, the Shadow Sea has got the same sort of standard. Stock standard, everything else, flip belts, holo suits, rising crescendo. It's got a pretty paltry, you know, stat line, but it's got that 8 inch movement. It's got a 7 plus save. Um, pretty much all your infantry here have 8 inch movement, so they are faster than even the fastest Eldar, which is fantastic. Um, the Shadow Sea certainly doesn't have the same attacks as the uh, Troop Master, who has 5 attacks, but then again, you know, you're. You, since they are your only two HQ choices, you're going to be bringing these two in spades, and they're both pretty good, and you can kit one out to be whatever you want, and the other one is just fantastic, because its psychic powers are always going to be useful. So you've got your standard troop. Um, these haven't changed. They've got Hollow Suit, Flip Belt, Rising Crescendo. They still haven't changed. Any model can replace this Shuriken Pistol with a Neuro Disruptor or a Fusion Pistol. Keywords there being Fusion Pistols. Um... The best way to run these guys in the index was to have, you know, two to typically two squads, maybe even three, all running around with those fusion pistols. They're going to be your primary anti tank source. Um, you can still do that. It's a little costly, but Harlequins themselves as a faction are actually pretty cheap across the board in terms of points. Um, so these are your bread and butter. You're going to be using these anyway. So your whole composition of your Harlequin army doesn't really change. Lots of these. Because you don't have a lot of variety, you're going to be fielding lots of stuff of the same ilk. Um, if you're playing with the stupid-ass rule of three, that's going to get on your nerves. But you shouldn't need more than three of anything except for the transports. Um, and because troops, uh, the troop, do not count to that, because they're a troop's choice. Um, then you've got your Elite's Choice straight into that. You've got the Death Jester, who's had a bit of a buff. Um, his gun is a little better. I don't have my index on me. T has that index because he, uh, he gets more out of the index than I do since I've only got one faction in it, and he's got two of them. Um, the Shrieker Cannon is, uh, pretty good. He's got his Deadly Hunter, so he can target characters now as a sniper. Um, he's got his flip bell, he's got death is not enough, any model, if any models flee from a unit in the same turn that has been attacked by this model, then you can choose the first model that flees instead of your opponent choosing. That is awesome, especially considering his shrieker profile on his, uh, shrieker cannon, uh, not only inflicts D3 mortal wounds if you, uh, slay an enemy model, but also you subtract two from... Yeah, also you subtract two from that unit's leadership. So, you can do some nice combos with him. So, he's, he's definitely improved. His, ma his major improvements come from the stuff later in the book that the Codex really adds. So, yeah. Your Solitaire is still there. He's still a mother fracking blender. Holy shit, does this thing blend. 8 attack space. Comes with a Harlequin's Caress and Kiss. The only issue with the Solitaire is only one can be included in your army. If that stipulation wasn't there, you'd probably just blend through shit and take nothing but these. So, one Solitaire, make sure to use it well. They can. I'm pretty sure you can set up to do some crazy stuff with them. Either or, they're just a great little blender unit with their uh, Blitz ability, which, oh boy. Um, also, it's kind of, it's also got a 3-up save here. It's got, it can never have a wall or trait, so don't even think about trying to do any of the stuff there. That's a little disappointing, but it's also appropriate fluff-wise. You don't want something this powerful. Blitz is the still the once per battle 
Um, instead of a normal move with the Solidor, Solitaire, you can move... Uh, you can make a Blitz move. If you do so, add 2d6 to your move characteristic until the end of the turn, which is fantastic because it doesn't count as uh, advance. So you can still advance after that. Its attack's characteristic is increased till 10, and you cannot use the ability if the model's already been selected for the Twilight Pathway Psychic power in your previous Psychic phase. Not a big concern there. It's probably already going fast enough. Speed is not an issue in this codex. All of these things move 8 inches. The Solitaire itself moves 12 inches. Uh, your Skyweavers um, are your jet bikes. Yep, the Skyweavers are your jet bikes. They move 16 inches. They're pretty fast. Um, You've got your... They still are the same. I think their Solar Bolus has been improved. I know the Haywire Cannon has been improved to be now Assault D6. Um, to be honest, looking between the two, I think the Haywire Cannon... I think this is a very good unit. <clears throat> Why? Because first off, you can replace your, your Star Bolus with a Zephyr Glaive. Now, the Star Bolus itself is Grenade D3, Strength 6, AP-3, 2 damage. 12 inch range. It's okay. Personally, I think the number one thing you're going to want to do with this is if you've got the Star Bolus, you're going to be going after you're going to be going after heavy infantry. That's what it's made for. But is that the most effective thing for it? Probably not. You'll probably better off give it in a Zephyr Glaive so that it can tie stuff up and fly around because it does have that impressive speed and it does have the slightly higher toughness and the three wounds and the three attacks. So, giving, so replacing that with the Zephyr Glaive will give you a nice little options because then you have it. So you have your unit that can participate, that can tie things up in melee, fall back, and you know still use its um, Shuriken cannons. And the Shuriken cannons itself is strength six, um, AP zero, one damage, twenty four inches assault three. So your the Solar Bolus does a bit more damage, but you're going to get a bit more reliability in terms of shots out of the shuriken cannon so rather than waste your time with the solar bolus i think it's better going with the zephyr glaive plus again the zephyr glaive is plus one strength so you're hitting at strength four which is decent your ap minus two that's the nice area of ap of just good enough um any ap is good ap this edition but ap minus two is in that sweet spot of it's you know it can hurt anything if you've got that AP minus two, and it's two damage. So you can ha you can hack chunks off of larger enemy units. You can tie up anything. You can deal with um, some heavy infantry with that. And then you've got the three wounds, and you've got the four up involve save. So you survive that, fall back, shoot them, charge in again, speed around, tying up their enemy units. It's a very good utility unit, and pretty sure it's your own. Yeah, it is your only fast attack choice, so there's no reason not to take three squads of these in a list. Um, funnily enough, I think filling out a brigade for these guys is going to be relatively easily, <laughs> relatively easy. You only have one option for everything anyway. Um, if you wanted to go that way, you'll probably end up making lots of brigades for those sweet, sweet command points. Sorry, not brigades. Lots of battalions. Lots of battalions, some supreme commands, maybe a couple of um, vanguards depending on how you want to do it, because you can do it, because you're going to need lots of um, certain staples, like troops and uh, your HQs, and then the rest of you guys, you can sort of split up in your army detachments to get more command points out of your roster. Even with a, you know, a, even if you guys would normally all fit into a brigade, you can kind of split them up to take advantage of that. Um, yeah, so the Sky, the Haywire Cannon itself makes them better for um, sort of tank hunting, because... The target vehicle, the target is a vehicle, and you roll to wound a 4+, plus. the target suffers a mortal wound in addition to any other damage. Um, that's great, because it's only strength 4, AP minus 1. Um, if the wound roll is a 6+, plus, the target suffers D3 mortal wounds. This is the equivalency of what Haywire used to be in 7th edition. Um, all the factions that relied on Haywire... ADMEC! <coughs> um, desperately wanted something like this, instead they got you know, guns that occasionally do D3 damage to a vehicle if you can happen to hurt them. Given their arc weapons and other ones are a bit stronger, personally this is better. Um, it's a Assault D6, 
so it's an unreliable number of shots, but, you know, if you have three of them running around, you can put on some serious mortal wounds, and mortal wounds onto vehicles is good. It's certainly a solution to heavier targets if you happen to be running short on fusion guns and all because somehow you've lost all your fusion guns. Your, sorry, your fusion pistols. Um, it's also a longer range than your fusion pistol because your fusion pistols that you can put on your troops, which are going to be forming probably a solid core of your army along with three other troops all with shuriken pistols and a range of melee weapons. Um, if you, you know, they're only 12-inch range. you got to get really close. This, you know... This gives a really big threat range, because it's 24 inches plus it's 16 inches. So, yeah. On top of that, they are really hardy and hard to get rid of these things. Because I did mention, they've got that 4-up save. They're the only thing with a 4-up armor so far that I've seen. Um, they auto-add 6 when they advance. So, <laughs> they're blisteringly fast. They can fall back and shoot, and they can charge. Um, and they can advance and charge. Um... And your opponent must subtract one from any hit rolls made against them in the shooting phase. So they're a fantastic unit, and you get a lot of versatility out of them. Um, definitely think you want to be including the... Well, no. You're going to be including some of those. Definitely recommend adding them. The Void Weaver. Alright, so the Void Weaver is always something that in 7th edition, when they were first introduced, were kind of craptastic. You'd never take them over the transport one. But they're also your only heavy support slot, so you're going to want them if you want to build up for a brigade. What they do, well, they're sort of, they're Venoms, but they have either one of the Haywire Cannons, which we discussed above, which I'd rather take three of those on uh, the Skyweavers than I would on one of this, or they can take the Prismatic Cannon, a really terrible version of a, well, a really terrible version that of the uh, Prism Cannon that is on the Fire Prism in the... Uh, uh, Craft World's book, uh, except it's a little bit weaker in terms of strength, still relatively the same in terms of damage and shots, um, except it's assault instead of heavy. Holy fucking Christ, would I give to have the prism cannon be assault and not heavy? Oh my god. Uh, if it was on a better platform and had the same strength as the, uh, the uh, Fire Prism one, it would definitely be worth taking, since it's Assault, but it's not, so you probably give them a miss. Um, you pr Again, for, every for the points you'd want to spend on this, you're probably going to want to spend more points to get another squad of troop with fusion pistols and stick them in a transport. Just saying. But, you know, it's got the same sort of things of... It auto-advances 6, it explodes, it's... Uh, I've got the Mirage launchers, so you're minus one to hit in the shooting, naturally. Um, it's got the four-up in Vol save. It's only got six wounds, though. It's toughness five, though. And it's 16-inch moves. So it's, it's okay. It is an okay gunship. Just don't... You, you, it's okay. The Star Weaver is pretty much the same thing, except it's a transport, and it's open-topped. So... Yeah open top transport so you just stick your guys in there and with your fusion pistols and you just fly around with your guys in there until this blows up get them really close with the 16 inch plus six movement and you fusion the crap out of stuff you get within that 12 inch range you get within that six inch range for the uh rolling two dice and pick the highest it's got the same stuff as the other one it's the same wounds um, except it has the, um, sorry, there is one stipulation. You can't do that with pistols. No, sorry. Uh, open topped. I've seemed to have read this wrong. Uh, models embarked on this model can attack in their shooting phase, measure the range, and draw line of sight from any point on this vehicle. When they do so, any restrictions or modifiers that apply... To this vehicle, apply to its passengers. For example, the passengers cannot shoot except with pistols. If this model is within one inches of an enemy unit, note that due to the rising crescendo ability, the passengers can shoot if this model falls back. Sorry, I was getting myself tied up there. It works exactly how I think it does. Um, except you don't want to advance because then you won't be firing your pistols. Um, 
Your opponent must subtract one to hit it, yeah. And it just comes with a shuriken cannon, which, <clears throat> you know, we know what the shuriken cannon does. If you have enough shuriken cannons fire at something, it will go down. There's a reason they're a solid, reliable gun that you'll find almost anywhere. And they're assault, so you can speed forward without losing any of your firepower. The new kid on the block. Okay, you have a single fortification in this book, which is now available to all Eldar factions. It is called the Webway Gate. It's massive in terms of model size. I haven't bought one yet, mostly because looking at their stats, I would never really take it. It's a fortification. Toughness 8, 14 wounds, 3 up save. Right. So it's going to go down like a bitch with some any sort of heavy weapon firing at it. Shimmering Arrival. When you set up this model during deployment, you can set it up anywhere on the battlefield that's more than 12 inches away from the enemy deployment zone and any enemy models and more than 3 inches from any other terrain features or the center of any objective markers. Okay. Eldritch Aura. It's got a 5 up invulnerable save. Okay. So... Okay, so means I get a 5-up save against las cannons and the like, but that's not super helpful. Those are still going to go through, Um, but it, it's something. A mobile obviously can't move, it's a bloody building. Um, Webway Strike. Uh, after you set up this model, any Eldari units you have not set up during deployment other than fortifications can be set up in the Webway Spa other than being set up on the battlefield. One unit in the webway spa can emerge from each friendly webway gate at the end of your movement phase. Set them up wholly within 3 inches of a webway gate and more than 9 inches away from an enemy model. If all friendly webway gates have been destroyed, any units not arrived from the webway spa are considered slain. So it's very risky, and I don't foresee you bringing more than one, so you'd probably only ever want one in it. Um, if you could guarantee that this thing would survive turn 1, like if you didn't get turn 1, if you can guarantee its survival, probably the best thing to put in it is a Wraith Knight, simply so that your Wraith Knight can come further up on the field and be protected first turn from any sort of Alpha Strike from shooting armies, which are obviously just going to destroy in a single hit. I speak from experience. I speak from experience there. For the Harlequins themselves, it's kind of redundant and they do not need it since they are so blisteringly fast. You'll find it's a very unimportant choice for this army in particular. Maybe for um, the other Eldar armies, it's a bit better. Um, definitely for Harlequins, it's not really required. It does have Webway Gate, and that's when you measure distances to and from a Webway Gate, you measure from the closest point on the model. If it's destroyed, you remove both the arch pieces. So, it's okay. Um, I'm going to have to check its points cost to see if it's worth taking a couple. If you could take a couple of these reliably, problem is they are fairly large and cumbersome and have some deployment issues there, as you, as I read to you. If you could take a couple, I will check that in a, at the end of this video, and we'll have a bit more discussion on this webway gate, since it's technically a new unit. So we've got Weapons of the Mask, that's, that's that. Um, so... Now, the real stuff that you're here for, we're talking about their new stuff. So, of course, they have Defenders of the Black Library, which is all your troops are objective secured. That, for those of you who don't know what objective secured is, um, it's if your troops are, if your troops have the special rule, then it doesn't matter how many guys your opponent has on it, so long as you've got guys with it, unless they also have objective secured. Mask forms, okay, so obviously this works just how you think it does with all the other masks. Now the masks themselves, <laughs> uh, so there's six of them, and every time I look at them, I get really furious and angry at the standard Eldar uh, traits, the craft world traits. Yeah, I'm still salty over that. I never did a review on that because I was just too, too salty to do an impartial review. Oh god, I hate that codex thing. <laughs> Okay, so you've got Midnight Sorrow. Uh, they have the Art of Death. Units with this uh, form move an additional D6 when they fall back. In addition, units with this form can consolidate up to 6. Doesn't sound immediately impressive, but that's basically being able to retreat and run. Yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, 
when you're a squishy Eldar, although, <laughs> funnily enough, this is probably the least squishy Eldar faction, when you're a squishy Eldar, the further away you can get from someone after they hit you is pretty good. Um, and the ability to be able to consolidate six means you can, with the kind of blender army this is, you can potentially blend through a unit and consolidate directly into another unit and tie them up. That's pretty good. So you can help um, deal with tar pits and blobs and screening units that way. And definitely, it's got some potential there. I really like that one. Uh, you've got the... It's not the most impressive one, but it's definitely got its utility. Uh, you've got the Veiled Path, probably the most famous of all Harlequin masks, if you know your lore. Um, at the start of each fight phase, roll two dice and discard the highest result. Until the end of the phase, each time your opponent targets a unit with this form and makes a hit roll, before... Hit roll? That before modifies exactly matches your dice roll, that hit roll fails. So, the um, demons of Zinch have the exact same thing for their loci, and it's wasted on them. It's more of a defensive thing on them, and you're if you're using it, you're probably already in trouble. Here, that's a lot more useful, and I really like that. The only issue is that it can be unreliable because you do have to discard the highest result when you roll 2d6, which means you can end up with something really stupid like your opponent automatically missing on results of 1, which they already do, or missing on 2s. And depending on what you're fighting, you know, that can be really good or bad. Um, it's still really interesting and flavoursome. I'd uh, really want to give that one a go if I was to get some Harlequins up, which hopefully one day I will. They're after the Orcs, hopefully. Um, it's not one I typically would foresee most people using um, in competitive play either. Neither of the Midnight Sorrow or the Veiled Path. But definitely the next two here, the Frozen S Stars with their Hysterical Fury. Uh, units in this form... If a unit with this form charges in the charge phase, add one to their attacks characteristic until the end of the ensuing fight phase. So... Transform your blender army into a bigger blender. So you're typically going to get the charge because you're that hysterically fast and there's nothing that stops you from being ridiculously fast and just charging anyway. So if you're not getting a first turn charge or at least just a really quick charge, you're just going to retreat and charge back anyway. And it's really good in this faction because, again, you do have that rising crescendo where you just... Fall back, charge again, you know, and there's no downsides to it. You can just keep getting your plus one attack. So it's really good on this sort of army. Um, that's one I typically see you're that's going to be taking, along with uh, Soaring Spite. Um, this is another good one. Um, this is one if you like the sort of run-and-gun ability, and, you know, you like the idea I spoke about before about putting lots of fusion pistols inside of the uh, void... Uh, what are they called? Uh, the transports. Um, models with this form that can fly or are embarked upon a transport that can fly, aka your only transport, treat all pestle weapons they are equipped with as Assault 1 during the turn in which they or they transport embarked upon advanced. So congratulations, that issue before about, you know, if you advance, you're not going to be able to fire your pistols, but you still got that blistering thing. Well, congratulations. You now got the ability to move even faster and still fire your pistols. Nothing is going to be able to you have re really short range on, you know, your pistols, since most of you guys have pistols. Um, but you're going to be able to get close enough to use them. Unlike, you know, other Eldar factions. In addition, the models do not suffer uh, the penalty to their hit rolls for shooting assault weapons during a turn in which they advanced. To be honest, I think this is probably the best one. Uh, the uh, Soaring Spite, uh, Serpent's Blood. It's probably the best one that you're going to be using 99% of the time. You're probably going to run a mixed attachment if you're really trying to metagame to go with a mixture of uh, Soaring Spite and Frozen Stars. Um, Dreaming Shadow have the Somber Sentinels. Now, this is when a unit with this form fails a morale test. Only one model in the unit flees, or must flee. In addition, each time a model with this form is slain... Or flees, roll a d6 before that model, before removing it. On a 4+, plus, it can either shoot with one of its ranged weapons, or it can make a single attack as if it were the fight phase. That's not bad, considering you can get in really, really fast. If you're encountering, you know, 
you can sort of... That's a really great thing. What I was saying before about um, mixing and matching your detachments and splitting up your thing is so that you can abuse these very easily. And this is a codex where you can abuse this very easily because you have that very limited variety where you require lots of the same things. So you just take them, take them, take them, take them. And then while you're doing that, might as well split them up so you can abuse these special rules. Um, that is one that you take if you see across from you, your opponent is taking something that you don't suspect you're going to be able to carve through that easily. Um, certainly the things that spring to my mind that you could use that against are certain durability armies like Thousand Suns, um, even um, things with uh, Tar Pits, Tyranids as well. Um, things that basically you're not going to be able to carve through, um, in a single turn. And you need, and you are going to take casualties, so you might as well make them pay for it before you fall back and try again into something else. Um, the other two before are definitely better. This one's okay, uh, the Somber Sentinels. It's definitely a very interesting one. It's unreal, it's not a guaranteed ability, sadly, because, you know, you're rolling a d6 and needing a 4+. plus. But 4 plus is a 50-50 chance. If you take a horrendous amount of casualties, you're probably doing Harlequins wrong, though. Um, still, Frozen Stars and Soaring Spite immediately spring to my mind. You, you know, mix those into a detachment and prepare, just pass your opponent something to uh, lube themselves up with. Um, Silent Shroud, the Dance of Nightmares Made Flesh. This is one that's not so great, but you can... Make builds around it. Like most things that rely upon leadership and leadership abilities, and Harlequins along with Dark Eldar are one of the things that can do it, and if you're going for that sort of build that screws with leadership, definitely consider taking Dark Eldar allies to a compl to uh, uh, complement this uh, any Harlequins with this mask trait. So, this one is subtract one from the leadership characteristics of enemy units while they're within six inches of any units, from your army with this form. In addition, whenever your opponent takes a morale test for a unit that is within six inches of any unit in your army, they must roll two dice and discard the highest. Um, so, I don't read anywhere about that stacking to a maximum, but I think from the way I'm reading that, it only applies once anyway. Which, I may or may not be wrong on that. The wording is it got me a bit off here for a moment, and I've this is probably one of the masks I've paid the least attention to. I've read through this book twice, three times. Um, so it's it's an interesting one. So stratagems. This is why you want to break up your things and build brigades. You've got a lot of delicious stratagems, and the not brigades, battalions. So you've got two CP, great Harlequin. Use a stratagem before a battle, select one of your troop masters. Uh, that unit gains the Great Harlequin keyword and gains the Will of Laughing God. Congratulations, in the fight phase you reroll hit rolls of one. So, now you're rerolling wound rolls in the fight phase for all you guys within six inches of them, and your hit rolls of one. So, a bit of a force modifier. It basic 2CP to turn your guy into a captain is a bit iffy. You can only do it to, uh... You can only use this stratagem once per battle, so you're only going to do it to one of them. Pray he doesn't get picked off by snipers, people. But it's it's okay and still worth it. It can increase it increases your accuracy, you know, in melee. So, nah, it's okay. Um, you've got the one that lets you take extra relics. Um, your relics in this codex are fantastic. So, yep, got the classic webway assault. That's still your bread and butter. It's a bit nerfed now because of the stupid, ridiculous beta rules that everyone, everyone seems to be taking as fucking gospel, even though they're beta rules. And I personally hate them quite a lot. Uh, not the soup one, just the deep striking one. But then again, this is an army that you're only going to use the webway assault if you need to protect a unit. It's more of a protection thing rather than a mobility thing for this army, since you're already blisteringly fast. Okay, Prismatic Blur is the same thing from uh, from Chapter Approved. 1 CP to use a stratagem on a Harlequin unit from your army that has advanced in the movement phase. And now is a 3-up and vulnerable save until the start of your next turn. Completely useless on a um, 
Ah, oh, shadows. No, not a shadows here. Solitaire, that's it. Completely useless on a solitaire. Pretty good on anything else, since you pretty much have four open vault saves across the board. So, and a three open vault save is pretty good. If you're expecting a unit to take a lot of fire, definitely that's the way to go. But you can only ever protect one unit with it, so it's okay. Um, 2 CP for Hero's Path. This is fun. It's also based, fun fact, it's based off an old uh, Harlequin's formation from 7th edition. Use a stratagem, 2 CP, use a stratagem at the start of your movement phase in which a Death Jester, a Solitaire, and a Shadows here from your army are within 6 inches of each other. Remove all three from the battlefield, and at the end of the movement phase, set them up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than nine inches away from any enemy units. I could see some potential there. Those are three very powerful characters, and the ability to translocate their locations just by having them together is pretty nice. So you've definitely got some real uh, potential there for Eldar Trickery. Um, Kogoroch's... Keg Segarach's, however you want to pronounce the Laughing God's name. Uh, his Jest, 1 CP. Uh, use a stratagem when an enemy unit falls back from a uh, Harlequin's unit from your army. After the enemy unit is finished moving, provided no other units are within 1 inches, you can shoot at the enemy unit that fell back as if it were the shooting phase. <laughs> you just charged an enemy... So, you shot, you have your fusion pistols, you eliminated one tank, you charged the other one, you, you know, scratched some paint off it. They fell back so that they can shoot with their tank, and because they fell back, you immediately pay one CP, you shoot at their tank, and boom, you've killed two tanks. Before they get to shoot with, it's, it's, oh, I love that. I love that one. That is fantastic. There's a... Key word to your stratagems here, Eldar Trickery. The uh, mind games with this with this uh, codex is really high, and on top of that, it's just really powerful. I love it. It is a blender army. You, you just blitz guys off the field. Um, the Hundred Swords of Vol. Use the stratagem at the start of the first battle round before the first turn begins. Select one Harlequin unit from your army, remove this unit from the battlefield, and redeploy it anywhere within your deployment zone. If you select a transport, all units embarked remain inside when it's de redeployed. If both armies have units that can redeploy, roll off. So, hmm, you can only use this strategy once. So, it's not as good as Phantasmum as the, you know, that the other Eldar factions have, but at the same time, this is 1 CP for 1 unit, and that one is uh, something like 2 CP for 3 units. So there's a bit of a change there. Still, mind trickery. Very good in your standard deployment. You, you can use it right. It's only 1 CP, so you can try and earn it back, I suppose. Torments of the Fiery Pit, 1 CP. Use a stratagem in the fight phase before attacking with a Harlequin's character. That has lost any wounds this battle round. Okay. Until the end of the phase, increase the strength characteristic and attacks characteristic of that model by two. Sweet. Strength never goes awry in this army since all you guys are piddly strength three clowns. Pansy dandy space cells that they are. And more attacks. Well, they're never not hurt. Only one CP. You're probably going to get wounded. You do only have a four up save. So... You can get a little bit more muscle and work out of your characters before they go. Uh, 1 CP for Vessel of Fate. Use a stratagem in your Psychic phase. A Shadow Seer from your army can attempt to cast one additional Psychic Power this phase. So that is immediately better than the Eldar one, which says you have to pass the previous Psychic test before you can attempt to manifest another one with their stratagem. That's kind of redonkulous. I thought I wasn't seeing Codex creep in the 8th edition Codexes, but ever since Necrons, I feel like I've been seeing Codex creep, and it's annoying me. But it's hard to judge on that factor, so I'm just going to ignore that line of thought with me for a moment. So, 
War Dances. 3 CP. Use a stratagem at the end of your fight phase. Select Harlequin unit that can immediately pile in and fight again. 3 CP for that. That's a lot more affordable now with the changes to command points. Uh, 1 CP for Fire and Fade. The classic, uh, you know, immediately after you shoot in the shooting phase, you can move 7 inches if it was a moving phase. However, you can't advance and it cannot charge in the same time it does so. so jump shoot jump for 1 CP. Same as the other Eldar codexes. Dramatic Entrance, 1 CP, use a stratagem at the end of your opponent's charge phase, a Harlequin's character from your army that is within 6 inches of an enemy unit can perform a heroic intervention and move up to 6 inches when it does so. So instead of a 3 inch heroic intervention, you get a 6 inch heroic intervention. It's okay. 1 CP for that, hmm. Warrior Acrobatics, use a stratagem in your movement phase. When a Harlequin's infantry from your army advances, add 6 inches to the move characteristic instead of rolling a dice. More speed never goes awry. Hopefully you've taken enough transports that you're already ridiculously close and you don't need to do that much advancing, but it's if you desperately need to go grab that objective and you know you need a guaranteed number, well, it's there. Shrieking Doom! Doom! 1 CP, use a stratagem before a Death Jester from your army shoots its Shrieker Cannon, or Curtain Fall, page 77, that's a relic, um, using the weapon's Shrieker Profile. So if you recall, that's the profile that, uh, if you kill an uh, infantry model, does D3 model wounds, and they have minus 2 leadership. Increase the weapon's strength characteristic by 1, and its damage characteristic to D3 until the end of the phase. So it becomes 1 shot, strength 7, AP minus 1, D3 damage. Well, you just became a lot more... No, it's already AP. No, it doesn't affect AP more. Sorry. Uh, so, yeah. So, that weapon just became a lot more um, effective in pulling off that any combos. You want to rely upon that. And only for one CP. Oh, yes. Um, they are much better, this edition. Just wait until we reach the relics. Oh, boy, the relics. Um, Isha's Weeping. When will that bitch stop crying? Maybe when Nokel releases it from her garden. From his garden. Uh, use a stratagem at the end of your fight. Any uh, any of your phases. Select a Harlequin unit from your army that has suffered casualties during the phase. Improve the units of vulnerable save by one to a maximum of three plus. Considering they almost all universally have four up, you're just gonna get to the three up minimum. Anyway, so, um, but hey, that's another way to. Get yourself a throw up invulnerable save. You should get your uh, space clowns to last a little bit longer in case you're not carving through your enemies like butter. Uh, like, for example, they've got super high toughness. Um, or invul saves. Use this uh, myth mythless hatred. Um, this is your classic um, when you fight against Harlequins, you re roll any failed hit rolls and wound rolls against Slanesh. In the fight phase. So, you know. Because Slanesh already doesn't cop it hard enough in this game. Um, although Slanesh might like that. The Labyrinth of Laughs. 1 CP. Use a stratagem when a webway gate from your army is destroyed. But before you remove the model from the battlefield, immediately set up one Eldari unit from your army that has not yet been um, deployed wholly within 3 inches of the webway and more than 1 inches away from an enemy model if you do so remove the okay so this stratagem is because I said before about the durability of that um, webway gate is laughable since if you put something in it or lots of things in it your opponent's probably just going to sh you know last cannon off the board or last cannon equivalent off the board really quickly so it's laughable Problem is, um, only Harlequins have this stratagem. All the other factions, they need this stratagem. Now, I haven't bought a box, but this particularly says Harlequin stratagem. So, because that is not available to the other factions, the other Eldar factions, who benefit much more from the Webway Gate than the Harlequins ever will, in the Harlequins it's just like a, ah, we, brought, we gave you something new. But it's completely useless to your army since you're already stupidly fast. Um, you literally don't need it as a Harlequin unit. As a Harlequin army, if you're just running solo Harlequins, you don't need it. 
this does give you incentive to bring Harlequin allies, but you shouldn't have to. You shouldn't have to. So, this annoys me. Otherwise, you could use this to, you know, congratulations, they've wasted a whole turn shooting out your Webway Gate. Now, as an Eldari Craftworlds player, you can pop out your Wraith Knight, and now they've already expended some heavy weapons shooting out it, so it's going to take less firepower. Congrats. No. No, it's... It's stupid. 2 CP for Lightning Fast Reactions. We all know what this does if we know anything about the Eldar Codexes. When your opponent goes to attack one of your um, Harlequin units, you just say 2 CP, minus 1 to hit. For some of your f units, this means you can get minus 2, even up to minus 3. So Eldar shenanigans concerning that matter are still in this book, which means they are a very good book. Since we know minus ones to hit are ludicrous, ludicrously punishing in this edition. Especially with factions, you know, that have, you know, four ups to hit. Five ups to hit. Oh my god, poor orcs. Poor orcs cannot compete this edition in terms of any sort of shooting. Hell, even their melee can be nerfed into the ground. <sighs> poor orcs. Orcs need a complete rewrite of the Codex, but different story. Um, you got your Haywire Grenades um, for 1 CP. You, uh, before a Harlequin model from your army throws a Plasma Grenade at a vehicle unit, you only make a single hit roll for that grenade. But if it hits, you do D3 model wounds. Uh, 2 CP for no price too steep. Use this stratagem. Oh, so now we're into the uh, specific mask stratagems here, just to let you know. So this is for the Midnight Sorrow. When this stratagem, use this stratagem when a Midnight Sorrow's character from your army is slain. Before removing the model as a casualty, it can fight as if it were the fight phase. If the character was a solitaire and it, or it was slain by a Chaos unit, add one to its strengths and attacks characteristic when resolving the fight. So T two CP for Midnight Sorrow just go, you know. Um, Veiled Path, Capricious Reflections. Once uh, CP, use this stratagem when your opponent. At the end of your opponent's charge phase, select a Veiled Path unit from your army. That unit can immediately perform a heroic intervention as if it were a character. That's pretty good. That's pretty good, actually. To be able to sort of intercept um, enemy charges with your own charges, even if it's the cost of CP, because, you know, you still count as, um... Yeah, that's pretty good. I... It has its uses. So, Veiled Path are the guys that roll the two dice, and you take the lowest, and your enemy re-rolls that. So, it's not bad. Um, probably would have been better on the Frozen Star guys. But the Frozen Star Mask for 2 CP, uh, use a strategy before a Frozen Star's unit in your army fights in the fight phase. Until the end of the phase, add one to wound rolls for attacks um, by this unit. That target enemy infantry, beast, or biker units. So, plus one to wound rolls can, is better. So, that's a good one to have. Complements them nice and well. And since you can pretty much always get yourself on the charge. So, you can fight first with that. Again, they are the portion of your army that when you are divvying up your army. In a 2000 point game or 750 point game to make your detachments. These are the guys you're going to, you know, all your fancy melee weapons that you can take. The guys that are designed for blending through their infantry and heavy infantry and stuff. So this this adds to your blending ability. Uh, Dreaming Shadow uses stratagem. This is an example, an example made is the name of the thing. Sorry, it's for the Dreaming Shadow mask. Cost 1 CP. Use a stratagem in your shooting phase. Select a Dreaming Shadow character in your army. Until the end of the phase, each successful hit roll made by this unit causes two hits. Hit rolls of a six plus made by this unit cause three hits instead. Congratulations on a Death Jester. You just mowed... Wow. Not on a Death Jester. Yeah. That's all I need to say. If I need to explain why that's good, I think you need to go and play a bit more Warhammer. Um... 1 CP, Sky Stride. Use this stratagem just before a soaring spite infantry unit consolidates. Instead of moving towards the nearest enemy model, 
The unit consolidates up to 6 inches towards the nearest soaring spike transport from your army if all models in the in the unit end their move within 3 inches of the transport they can immediately embark if it has sufficient capacity to do so as if it were the movement phase and they can do so even if they disembark from the transport during the same turn space elves jump out space elves kill something space elves jump back in space elves fly away space elves rinse repeat until the enemy is nothing but giblets on the floor soaring spite and frozen stars are Definitely the two winners, but each of these is really cool in its own way, and each of them has definitely has potential. 2 CP for the Silken Knife. This is for the Silent Shroud Mask. Use this stratagem at the start of the charge phase. Select a Silent Shroud unit from your army. Enemy units cannot fire overwatch against that unit in this phase. That. That is fantastic. Sure, it costs you 2 CP. But if you're going to charge something that's got really reliable overwatch, that's and for a really assaulty melee-driven army, that's got to be really close. It makes really good use of all th of the phases. Yeah, that's a good thing to have. So, some of the more, as per the tradition of Games Workshop games design, some of the weaker masks that have less enticing uh, traits certainly have some very good um, stratagems to help make up for it. And the ones that are got really good traits have really useful things that just make them even more enticing. Uh, so your Phantasmic Discipline. So you still got Twilight Pathways, which is Warp Charge Value 6. So these are your Psychic Powers. Um, you know, it's, it's Warp Time, basically, for Harlequins. You select a friendly Harlequin unit within 3 inches of the Psyker and visible to it. It can immediately move it with a movement phase. Can't do it more than once in each Psychic phase, though. Okay. You probably only need to use it once, so you already move faster, and that's just a free move. It's a very good one. You're probably going to have that on someone. There's a reason you're going to be taking 2 to 3, um, two to three um, Shadow Seers. They each know 2 Psychic Powers plus Smite. So if you take three of them, you can basically take everything. Ah, uh, sorry, I missed a um, a uh, stratagem there. Sorry, going back one second, I missed a stratagem, which was Webway Ambush. Use the stratagem at the end of your movement phase. Choose a Webway Gate from your army. Either two units in the Webway Spire can emerge from that Webway Gate this turn, or one unit can emerge from that Webway Gate and be set up wholly within three inches of it, and more than one inches away from any enemy models. For one CP. Again, those need to come with the box. I'm not sure if they do. They need to not be Harlequin exclusive stratagems. Because that's just fucking retarded. Pardon my language. If there's anyone watching, please do not copy me. Language is... That is bad language. I apologize. <sighs> okay, you've got Fog of Dreams. Back to Psychic Powers. Fog of Dreams, you've got Warp Charge Value 6. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 18 inches of the Psychic, you're invisible to it until the start of your Psychic phase. Your opponent must subtract 1 from all hit rolls for that unit when it targets a Harlequin's infantry unit. It's a minus 1 to hit. And most of your armor is infantry. Yeah, you're taking that. Mirror of Minds. Uh, this one is Warp Charge Value 7. If manifested, select an enemy unit within 24 inches of the Psyker. Then both players roll a d6. If a Harlequin player rolls... Roll is equal to or higher than the opponent's, then the target suffers one mortal wound. Repeat this process until the target is destroyed or until the enemy player rolls a result higher. So it's a high Warp Charge. It's unreliable at best, but it's also very, very fun. Having seen this in action... If your opponent rolls really shit, oh boy, are they just going to stack the mortal wounds? Because you just keep going and going and going until um, until they roll higher than you or until they're dead. So that can be really annoying if they can get that off. Veil of Tears has a warp charge value of 7. If manifested, select a friendly Harlequin infantry unit within 18 inches of Psyker. Until the start of your next Psychic phase, subtract 1... 
from hit rolls for attacks made against that unit. So you have two powers in your discipline which you can stack that have minus ones to hit. And people in the tournament scene thought that the Altioch, Elotic craft world was ridiculous with how high you could stack that. Hmm. Shards of Light. Warp charge value 7. Select an enemy unit that's within 18 inches of the Psyker invisible to it. The unit suffers D3 mortal wounds and must subtract one from its leadership characteristic until he... Starting next fight phase. So, D3 Mortal Wounds never goes astray, and stacking leadership penalties can go to certain builds that rely upon that. It's not bad. Um, Webway Dance. Use... Has a Warp Charge value of 7. If manifested, then... Until the start of your next Psychic phase, roll a D6 whenever a friendly Harlequin unit within 6 inches of the Psycho loses a wound. On a 6, that wound is not lost. So, Warp Charge value 7. Give... Make your Shadow Seer a living bubble of feel no pain. Six up. Sweet. All of those psychic powers are fantastic. Shadow Seers, if you haven't gathered, are bloody essential to making this army. And they are. got so many options. So we'll briefly run through the Warlord traits because we've gone a bit over time because I spent too much time on the units. Um, Warlord traits Luck of the Laughing God. Uh, re-roll hit rolls, wound rolls, and damage rolls of one for your warlord. Okay. For someone who rolls a lot of ones like me, well, actually, I roll a lot of twos, which I typically don't need. So, that's an okay one. Doesn't immediately stand out. Uh, Fractal Storm, your warlord has a three plus invulnerable save against melee weapons. You're going to be in melee a fair bit with most of them. Except for Shadow Sea, you probably don't want to be in melee unless you're guaranteed to win. Um, so, but three up invulnerable save never goes astray. Uh, a foot in the future, add two inches to your Warlord's movement characteristic. In addition, add one to the distance your Warlord can move each time it advances, falls back, charges, or performs a heroic intervention, piles in, or consolidates. To quote Sonic, gotta go faster. Player of the Light, re-roll failed charge rolls made for your Warlord and any friendly mask units whilst they are within 6 inches of your Warlord. Okay, this one immediately stands out as a definite. That's probably an auto-take if you're not taking one of the mask ones. Uh, Rerolling your charge rolls, definite. Definite, definite, definite. Can never go wrong with that. Um, And it buffs multiple units. Instant force multiplayer on an army that wants to charge. Player of the Dark. Uh, each wound roll of 6 plus made for your warlord's attacks in the fight phase and inflict one mortal wound in addition to the normal damage. There's no real way so far that I've observed. I might have missed one in the relics that lets you stack that. Stack your hit rolls high, so I like to get pluses to it. So that one immediately stands out as a nah. Uh, player of the Twilight. Um, this... Okay, so Player of the Twilight is your standard, you get, you know, once per battle you can re-roll a hit roll, wound roll, save roll, in addition your army is battle forged and warlord is on the battlefield, roll a d6 each time you or your opponent uses a stratagem. If the result exactly matches the number of command points spent on the stratagem, you gain that many command points. Holy shit. So, instead of having a roll of 6... You need to roll equal to the number of command points they just spent. And you get that many command points. So if they just did a three command point thing, you roll a dice. And if you roll a three, you'll get three command points. And same if you do it. That is your auto take right there. That is your command point farm auto take. Because as we saw in those um, stratagems, they're all really good, except for the ones concerning the webway strike, the webway gate, which you will never use. But that one and a player of light, holy shit, those are your defaults. But definitely player of twilight. That is just your auto take. If you're not taking that, you're taking player of light because the rest are meh. Okay, now, the mask-specific ones. You've got Midnight Sorrows, Nemesis of the Damned. Uh, each hit roll of a 6+, plus with your Warlord in the fight phase, scores 2 hits instead of 1. In addition, 
you add one to hit rolls made by your warlord against chaos. So there's one of the stacking things, but you can't mix it up with the other one there, so... Meh. Still defaulting straight to player of twilight for those command points. Failed path, webway walker. During your deployment, you can set up your warlord in the webway. Instead of placing it on the battlefield, your warlord can emerge at the end of any of your movement phase. Set it up anywhere on the battlefield, nine inches from enemy units. Furthermore, you can use the webway assault stratagem twice. Which one was the webway assault stratagem? The webway assault stratagem. Ah, yes. That's the good webway assault stratagem, the one that doesn't require a, uh... The one that doesn't require the webway gate. The good standard old and golden oldy one that just, you know, one CP to put one thing. Sweet. So that, in total, will let you put four units plus your... Plus one of your... Plus your warlord. So that's five units you can have in Deep Strike waiting to come on. If you're not running lots of transports, that's pretty fantastic. So Veiled Path is pretty good for cheap. So, yeah. Their trait may be very defensive and a little less useful than the other ones. But their Warlord trait and their stratagem are okay. Especially their Warlord trait. That's definitely good. Still that player of Twilight. Oh boy. Frozen Stars. Our kin shall rise again. Roll a d6 each time a model from a Frozen Stars unit from your army. Within 6 inches of your warlord loses its final wound. On a 6 that wound is not lost and the model is not slain. The warlord trait has no effect if the unit is under the effects of the webway dance psychic power. So this one blocks being slain, the other one is just to feel no pain. So that's the difference, but you can't stack them either. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Still would rather go Player of Twilight. Or, particularly for Frozen Stars, uh, Player of Light. Um, Dreaming Shadows get Warned of the Dead. Add one to any somber sentinel rolls made for your army. So... For Dreaming Shadow unit from your army that has been 6 inches of your Warlord. As two, whilst there are any Necron units on the battlefield. So instead of being able to shoot and fight on a 4-up if you die, you'll go to a 3-up if you're near your Warlord, or you go to a 2-up if there's Necrons afoot. Sweet. That one's actually really good. All of these are really good. Well, all of the are specific ones. Uh, some of the... Uh, Regular ones are pretty trash. But all of these ones so far, except for the Midnight Sorrow one, are actually really, really good. And they all have lots of potential. Problem is you can only have one Warlord, and st and only one Warlord trait. And Player of Twilight still just takes the cake. But if you are going for that really, really fluffy, that is you. That is really good. Especially if you're going to be fighting Necrons, because they're an example of an army that you're going to struggle to carve your way through. Which is an example of, you know, the kind of times you're wanting to be using the Dreaming Shadow Mask. Soaring Spite. Your Warlord can disembark from a transport even after it has moved. That's fantastic. That is pretty good, because you... I mean, it's somewhat good. He's going to be vulnerable jumping out of that transport by himself, because it only applies to your Warlord. But at the same time, he moves, jumps out, goes to something else where you transport, you know, does something different. The Don't underestimate the ability just to be able to get out of a transport after it moves. There's a lot of times that's going to come in handy. Uh, still, Player of Twilight. <laughs> I keep going back to that one. That is such a great command point farm. Although, Frozen Stars... Dreaming Shadows and Veiled Path certainly are worthy of your attention. Um, Silent Shroud, the final joke. If your Warlord is slain in the fight phase, roll a d6. On a 2+, plus, the unit that killed your Warlord suffers d3 mortal wounds after it is finished making all of its attacks. On a 6, the enemy unit suffers d6 mortal wounds instead. There's a lot of just trolling in this codex. It's pretty great. 
All right. We've gone a little bit over time, but we're going to come to the final section here, and we're going to try and go through this pretty thoroughly. And, you know, we're, we're going to do this right. So we're, this is just going to go a little bit longer. So, time for your Enigmas of the Black Library, your relics. So, Mask of Secrets. The bearer increases their leadership characteristic by one. You don't care about that. You're space elves. In addition, all enemy units reduce their leadership by one whilst they are within six inches of the bearer. That is another way I've talked about. about... So that's an artifact that you can use to contribute to things that if you're going to ally with Dark Eldar, or if you're just going to build around inflicting lots of damage and then doing lots of um, morale damage. The Storied Sword. Model with a power sword only. The Storied Sword replace... Yeah. Uh, so it's a power sword with plus one strength. Cool. Never goes wrong with plus one strength on a power sword. It's the AP minus three of a power sword. And it's D3 damage. You re-roll failed hit rolls for this weapon. That is a sweet... That, that's actually a pretty sweet uh, melee weapon for carving, for carving guys up. It's pretty good to have on a, uh... Ooh. Yeah. Put that on your troop master with, uh, Frozen Stars. Or even with some other stuff. Any of those will or traits actually would be really good. Anyway. Uh, the Suit of Hidden Knives. Now, this is one I can tell you I've seen in practice. Holy shit. This is the relic equivalent of... So, the Death Guard have the separating plate. Which is nice. It definitely makes you a lot more durable. But this one, this one is the equivalent of stop hitting yourself. Roll a d6 each time your opponent rolls a hit roll of 1. Sorry, roll a d6 each time a hit roll of 1 is made for an enemy model targeting the wearer in the fight phase. On a 2+, plus, that model's unit suffers a mortal wound after the unit has resolved all of its attacks. People will roll... Ones will be rolled. Even with re-rolls, there are probably going to be some ones. So... That can be very, very trolly. And in the right thing, can basically just... If you get very, very lucky, your opponent can just kill them, their entire unit outright just by attempting to attack you. That's very cool relic. It's very good relic. It's probably... Ooh, I wouldn't say it's an auto-take, but it's definitely high up there. There's definitely reasons to take multiple relics and pay the stratagems to use multiple relics in this kind of army. Crescendo. Uh, this replaces a shuriken pistol. You should not give it any more thought than that. It's a D6. It's a pistol D6 shuriken pistol with strength 4 and 2 damage and the normal blade storm ability of 6s to wound or AP minus 3. Give it no more thought than it is a pistol. A fancy pistol. The Star Mist Raiment. The wearer has a 3 plus invulnerable save against ranged attacks. That's pretty good. In addition, enemy units cannot fire Overwatch at the bearer during a turn in which the wearer advanced. Sweet. There's some really, really good potentials. You can put that on um, a Hulk on Troop Master with the ability that... um. With the Warlord trait to let them jump out of the transport from Soaring Spite after it's moved. So the Soaring Spite moves up, he moves up, and then he advances, and then he jumps in. No, you can't overwatch him. Murders that heavy weapons squad with his Power Sword or his Harlequin's Quiss. A-OK. -okay. There's nothing that actually says Solitaires cannot take relics either that I've seen so far. So the suit of hidden knives and the Starmus Raiment. Um, the Starmus Raiment is more for the Overwatch. The three up invulnerable save doesn't really matter for the Solitaire, but the ability not to be Overwatched with your Solitaire. If you've advanced, sweet. I'm just, I'm just gonna. The these relics are really good. They really are. 
especially with just the sheer number of combinations, is too many for me to go into in this kind of review. I'd probably need another hour and a half just to go through all the different possibilities of different builds and different stuff we could do. Um, the Laughing God's Eye. Um, friendly Harlequins automatically pass morale tests while they're within six inches of the wearer. Shouldn't matter too much to you. In addition, roll a d6 each time a friendly Harlequin unit suffers a mortal wound in the psychic phase whilst within six inches of the bearer. On a six, that mortal wound is ignored. Okay. Uh, Sagarach's Rose, or Cockroach's Rose, depending on how you want to pronounce it, it replaces a Harlequin's Kiss. It's a fancy Harlequin's Kiss with, well, it's a Harlequin's Kiss, and then it re-rolls, wound rolls for this weapon. When attacking infantry, this weapon has damage of three. It's probably overkill on most infantry, but still good. Midnight's Chime. Uh, so this is for Midnight's Sorrow Mask. Uh, once per battle, at the beginning of the fight phase, you can activate the Midnight's Chime. Until the end of the phase, all Midnight Sorrow units increase their attacks characteristic by one until whilst they're within six inches of the bearer. That's pretty good. I mean, it's only once per game, though. So you're really going to be relying on that suddenly blitzing the enemy off the field. If you haven't gathered, you're all in or nothing. Or your repeated strikes. So the mirror stave is for the veiled path. It replaces. So you can only give it um, to a shadow seer. So it's got a shooting profile, which is 12 inches, assaults 6, AP minus 1, 1 damage. Its strength is dash. Its melee profile is melee, AP minus 1, D3 damage, dash. Uh, the wound roll required for this weapon in the shooting phase is equal to the target's unmodified ballistic skill. For example, if the weapon targets an enemy unit with a ballistic skill of 3+, the weapon will wound on a 3+. The wound roll required for this weapon in the fight phase is the same as their unmodified weapon skill. If the unit contains models with different ballistic skill weapon skill characteristics, use the best characteristic in the unit. If they have dash for their weapon skill ballistic skill, then it wounds on a 6+. plus. That's really, really tricksy and awesome. But I'm pretty sure there are better things. The Ghoul Mask. Frozen Stars model only. The wearer of the Ghoul Mask can attempt to deny one psychic power in each enemy psychic phase in addition in the same manner as a psyker in addition add one to the deny the witch test made by the bearer I'd probably give that one a bit of a miss that's kind of disappointing for the frozen stars guys I'd probably rather have the midnight um, chime instead of that if I was taking them but you can't have a single perfect mask that's not how this that's not how the game design works you've got the curtain fall this is for Dreaming Shadow and the Death Jester only. So the Dreaming Shadow, so the Curtain Fall, has its Shrieker and Shuriken profile like a standard Shrieker cannon. 30 inch range, the Shrieker is Assault 1, Strength 7, AP minus 3, Damage 1. Sweet. The Curtain Fall, Shuriken profile is Assault 3, Strength 7, AP minus 2, Damage 1. Double sweet. Uh, when attacking with this weapon, choose one of the profiles above. above. Each time you roll a wound, roll of 6 plus for this weapon. Its hit is resolved with AP minus 4. Each time an infantry model is slain by an attack made for this weapon, Shrieker profile, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. If any model in the unit is slain by this weapon, subtract 2 from that unit's leadership characteristic until the end of the turn. This modifier is not cumulative with that caused by a Shrieker cannon. You can't stack it, sadly, but that's taking a Shrieker Cannon and dialing it up to max. And you can combo that with the Stratagem to make them Strength 8, Damage 2, AP minus 3. <laughs> Death Jester's got good. Falchu's Talon. Okay, Soaring Spite model only. While the wearer is embarked on the Soaring Spite transport, that vehicle may move an additional 6 inches in the movement phase. Sweet. Because you need it to be faster. In addition, if a Soaring Spite model is 
So if a soaring spike transport is destroyed while the wearer is embarked upon it, you do not need to roll any dice to see if any disembarking models are slain or if the transporting slave explodes. No disembarking models are slain and the transport just does not explode. I'll be honest, I would take that, the suit of hidden knives, and the star mist raiment. I would take those three relics. I'd give probably the suit of knives to a solitaire. I'd probably give the star mist raiment to shadow seer, just for that extra protection. And the Falchus talon to a troop master. Riding in a transport with some fusion fusion troop. Yeah. That's an awesome one. And that's for Soaring Spite, which I think we've pretty much established are probably the best... One of the best masks in this. Not that they're any bad masks. They all have really good potential and they're all... They seem like they're all really fun to play with. So, and they've, they've all got their own little tricks they can pull off. So, Silent Shroud, they have the Skintalan to Veil. It's a Troop Master Shadow Seer only, and increases all, increases the range aura of all of the wearer's abilities by three inches. Oh my god, that's also another fantastic one. Do not underestimate the difference that can make in a game. I speak from a death card perspective where the one relic that boosts that kind of those abilities is absolutely a must take. That's nine inch ranges on your abilities. Don't don't underestimate that extra three inches. That can be fan that can be the difference. Ah uh, in this particular case, that's increasing your re-roll wound in the fight phase for your troop master, or your minus one to wound against your infantry. Oh. Oh, these are so good. All right. Just gonna quickly, before I end this review up, because now we've covered everything except for the tactical objectives, which I'm not interested in, you're probably not interested in, they're not really important. Um, we'll take a quick look at just... Some points got and some general rounding out some thoughts about this codex. So, we've got a lot of, just a quick thing to give you an idea of some of the points costs here. A lot of things in this codex are zero points. The things that aren't zero points, there's nothing that really exceeds ten points. The most expensive weapons in this codex are the Prismatic Cannon at twenty points, the Neurodisruptor at ten points, and the Haywire Cannon at... Uh, 15 points. Okay. So, just to give you guys a bit of an idea of just how cheap this army really is. You got your Death Jester at 45 points base. They have their Shrieker Cannon, which costs 0 points. So they're just 45 points. They can do a lot of damage at 45 points. Your Shadow Weavers are 125 points base. Um, zero points for their hallucinating. Yeah, yeah. Their uh, Starve is zero points. So yeah, they're 125 points. That's a solid price for a really solid HQ choice. It's typically the price you'd pay for something like a fully decked out captain or something. It's It's... You don't have any named characters, but that's a pretty good points cost in terms of a HQ that is pretty much a must-take in this army. Then again, there's very few things in this army that aren't a must-take. Solitaire is 84 points, plus it has the Harlequin's Kiss and Harlequin's Embrace, which are 6 and 7. Or does it have the Harlequin's Cress? I forget. It's got one of them, but they're all the same points cost. 7, 6, or 7. Um, so he's ridiculously cheap. You can only take one, so you'd want him to be. But he can also do a lot of damage. Um, Star Weavers are 79 points, plus their, uh, Shuriken Cannons, which are 10 points, so they're about 89 points for a Star Weaver. Sweet. 
Uh, your bikes are expensive at 30 points a pop, coming in squads of minimum 2 to 6. Um, it does get really pricey if you want to put the Haywire Cannons on them, but they are only 5 points more than the Shuriken Cannon. The Zephyr Glaives are 6 points, so while they're a good unit, their costs will add up really, really quickly. I don't typically talk about points cost, but I will in this case. Simply so you can get an idea of just how many... You're going to be able to feel a lot in a 2,000 point army. And this is going to be one of those armies that... You're going to hurt people bad. They're going to get very angry when your 45 point death jester eliminates, you know, their 200 point infantry squad. Um... Yeah, your troops are 13 points of cost. Your webway gate. So here's the webway gate that we're just going to talk about for a moment here. It's 120 points. That's a stupid points cost. <clears throat> I'll be honest. But, it could have been worse. It's an average points cost, I guess, for something with that many wounds and that kind of save. But for something that sits around and does nothing and will probably die before it does anything, do you really want to pay 120 points for that? This is going to be a bit off topic, but I'm... This is the kind of thing where Age of Sigma has it on the right track, where certain things that are faction-specific, you know, cost zero points. Like Plague Trees, sorry, what are they called? Feculent Naromors, um, and, um, and, uh, Sylvaneth Wildwoods. Shit like that should be zero points for their faction. If they're battle-forged. I think Webway Gate should be zero points if you're battle forged. I think Drop Pods should be zero points if you're battle forged. But so there's that. I, that's just an opinion I have. It's kind of unrelated to this guy's review. But the Webway Gate strikes me as pretty stupid, to be honest. It's awesome. I, lo I love that it's a thing now. It's just stupid. So. That's it for the Harlequins review. Thank you very much for watching and um, listening. Um, this has been Jay from Jade Productions. I hope this has been informative and helpful for you if you're planning to start collecting a Harlequin army or if you've got a Harlequin army and haven't bought a codex yet and you're just wondering a bit more about them and getting trying to get a different perspective on what they're like. Um, in terms of tournament scene, I reckon these guys are solid contender. They're a very solid army. You can run them by themselves. You can run them as allies. They probably are. Fast, ah, uh, they, by themselves, they are a very good army, let's just put it that way. They don't really need any help, and they can lend a lot of help to other armies. Think of it this way, if you're going to bring them as allies to existing Elder armies, that it's more along, it's, it's not your Harlequins are getting help from them, it's your Harlequins are giving help to the other Elder. All right. I've been Jay from Jay Productions. Thank you once again. Be sure to check out some of our other work and stay glued for our next review, which hopefully will come out a little quicker um, following the Codex's release, uh, which will be Imperial Knights. Oh, boy. Uh, so, that's it for now. See you next time.